So I have a bit of a confession to make. See, all of this YouTube stuff, this whole channel really loses money. Like it doesn't, it makes a little bit of money, but it doesn't actually like make any profit or anything like that. It is, it is a, a its major financial function is losing money. Um, although we do obviously do it for the community, we do it for the fact that wine needs to be able to graduate itself into a video based medium eventually. And we feel that we could kind of help that along a little bit. I find it personally very hard to justify everything that we do here to my wife, who also happens to be the CEO of the company. Uh, and you know, her right to question whether or not this thing is even profitable is pretty fair, uh, you know, to be honest. You know, that is what the, the function, the purpose of a business is to, to generate value and profit. Um, you know, so I've always found it really, really difficult in terms of marketing in particular, not so much sales, but marketing to uh, justify anything based on evidence. Most of what I do is based on intuition uh, in, in a fair, fairly big dose of belief. Um, and so I've always been attracted to people or individuals that find a way to be able to actually put cold, hard facts around marketing concepts. So enter a fascinating individual, Larry Lockshin, who I got to meet prior to COVID, who is an emeritus professor in marketing, uh, locally based uh, here in South Australia, um, and specifically in the realms of wine. So an absolute uh, incredible individual to chat to if you are a winery or if you are interested in wine marketing in general. Uh, he was one of the first that I got to read about that uh, brought into the sort of sphere of marketing this this concept of being 100% evidence-based. Basically, if it doesn't involve data, then Larry kind of doesn't really want to know about it. Um, and that really blew my mind uh, a fair bit, and I hope it blows yours too. Um, so I don't want to ruin too much of the surprises, but he does blow apart a lot of um, common uh, marketing myths, particularly around customer loyalty, and also goes in depth into explaining a little bit uh, behind the reason that uh, exceptionally large wine companies are successful and therefore different as well to successful small uh, wine companies. Anyway, thank you so much for everyone that listened to episode one, um, provided feedback, commentary, especially on the Discord, uh, and any, any advice that you guys might have as to how to improve what we're doing here, uh, but also any advice as to um, uh, what guests you think uh, you would love uh, to have this interview, please throw it in the comments or jump on the Discord or send us a message or homing pigeon or something or other. Anyway, I'm going to get into it straight into Larry Lockshin. Enjoy. Uh, well, I mean, firstly, of course, thank you so much for dedicating your time. It's actually really good to, to speak to you because I remember when you came up with a group of students, um, Christ to Unico, it probably it was with Armando Corsi maybe like three years ago or was it pre-COVID? I think, um, and, and I didn't really get a chance just to pick your brains no. um, at that point. So I'm glad I've locked you down for like an hour so I can really okay. sort of get, get in depth. But for the folks playing at home, would you mind, uh, Larry, introducing yourself and letting us know sort of what's, what's been your career in wine and where you <laughs> sit sort of sitting with wine now? Well, when you've been around it as long as I have, I don't want to take the whole hour talking, but I'm Larry Lockshin. I was born in Ohio in the U.S. I ended up doing a degree, bizarrely, but in, in comparative literature and ancient Greek and history <laughs> before I eventually found the light and um, went back to uni and studied, eventually went to Cornell, where I did a master's in viticulture and pomology, which is fruit production. And I worked for about seven years as a what is often called the U.S. an extension specialist, a fruit specialist, working with growers in Missouri, basically. And eventually the last four years was with great growers, specifically at the University of Missouri, where they were rebuilding an industry that historically had made grapes and wine in the mid eight when the German settlers who had come escaping persecution in Germany settled along the Ohio River then after Phylloxera, they settled along the Missouri River, thinking it looked like the Rhine. So that's a long story to say that I have a degree and I worked as a viticulturalist there before um, really deciding to do a PhD. And when I was trying deciding to do that, I also got a call from the Ohio Grape and Wine Industry. So they hired me to run their program where they were getting a penny a bottle 
for wine sold in Ohio, which made about five a year, which had to be spent on research and on marketing. So I knew a lot about research and grapes, and I'd been working with growers. And bizarrely, I was probably the only student at Cornell who did a master's in science, who also did a survey of consumers as part of my master's. So I ended up moving to Ohio, went to Ohio State, started in horticulture and ended up in marketing because my job involved marketing. We won't go into more detail, but I got a PhD that included most of the marketing work, also consumer psychology and also agriculture economics. So that's the short end of it. I ended up in a time when there weren't many jobs working in Canada for a few years. I came to warm up and thaw my toes out in Australia and got a job offer here. That was 1994, and I moved here. So I've been in Australia quite a long time. I worked at what was called Roseworthy Campus, which was an agricultural campus at the University of Adelaide, had a wine program. And then from there, it was really too focused in my mind on science, not that science is bad, but I wanted to be in marketing. So I ended up moving to the University of South Australia in 1999 and stayed there till I retired in um, 2000. That's the positive is history. What, is the thing that sort of fascinated me most, uh, and there's many things that have fascinated me about, about yourself, Larry, uh, has the the focus on, on evidence-based marketing. But this is sort of interesting. I didn't realize how much of a science-based background. Did that directly inform your approach to marketing being so evidence-based? Initially, no. I went to Ohio State, which was a top marketing school, one of the top 10 or 15 in the U.S. And when you say evidence-based, we ha I think we have to separate out people who do surveys and collect information, data, and say that's evidence. But if your mm. sample is small, and I have to mm. say, when we were at Ohio State, because it was a place where publishing was important, a lot of the samples were students. Student samples don't nece necessarily represent the population mm. and there's a whole thing called weird Western European something or other, where most of the research in psychology marketing has been done on white Western students in universities, and they do not represent the world, even when we're looking at how people's brains work. And I didn't know any of this. I went to Ohio State. Yes, we did research. We actually did experimentation. But I have to say, having studied at Cornell and taken like real experimentation, like field experiments, experimental design did me a lot of good. Eventually, when I started practicing in Missouri, doing experiments in the field with growers, and eventually when I started doing research when I came to Australia. But it wasn't until I met Byron Sharp, who's the director of what is now called Ehrenberg Bass, it was then called the Marketing Science Center, where we were disciples, if you want to call it that, of a person, a professor by the name of Andrew Ehrenberg, who really was all about big enough samples so that what you could say could be extrapolated to a population. So when we talk, we talk about evidence-based marketing, we talk about nowadays collecting millions of data points of purchasing and being able to look at patterns based on those rather than a survey of 250 people, if that makes sense to you. Of course, yeah. So you're, it's your end number, isn't it? So if 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 your sample well, sets too end, I mean, we we did some surveys recently, Armando Corsi and I, where you can get a reasonable extract extrapolate above <laughs> sample of wine drinkers in Australia with about five six hundred people. If that sample is truly of, the, of you're trying to project to wine drinkers, so you don't have to yes. have thousands to do that. Most political samples aren't, they may be thousands because it's across a whole country and you've got all kinds of different backgrounds. But if you want to look at wine drinkers in Australia, the US, wherever, you know, 600 to 1,000 will give you a pretty good sample that's predict, that as will give you a predictable what the absolute population might do. I suppose uh, given that the, the sample itself is of, of quality enough, you know. Well, that's what I'm like saying. saying you know, you if, it's say, all, if it's all students, it's sort of irrelevant, right? No, we match our sample. When we say I got a sample of Australian wine drinkers, we'll look at Roy Morgan, which is one of the big ongoing surveys here in the U here in the U.S. Um, here in the U.S. here in Australia, and say, are 
gender balance, our age group balance, our income balance, our spread around the country is similar to Roy Morgan's surveying of 20,000 Australians, some of whom drink wine. Well, 60% of whom drink wine. So when we do that, we can actually say we are matching the Australian wine drinking population. Right. Because I... I've I've been on the receiving end once of uh, acquiring uh, quite stupidly uh, one of these data sets. They're very expensive. Yes, well, that's why we don't get them any other way, but are collecting them ourselves, really. But go ahead. So. <laughs> well, it's funny because uh, I, I interviewed yesterday uh, Peter McTamney. Uh, yeah, I know Peter uh, very well. Yeah, yeah. And I find his approach to, to data and interpretations truly sort of quite quite valuable, especially for mm. a smaller producer that doesn't have you know, ten thousand dollars to to throw at uh, exceptionally <laughs> large data sets with no no interpretive notes, um, you know, th- yeah. thrown into it. But it's interesting because a lot of these, I was trying to understand how I, as an individual producer, a wine producer, uh, could be a little bit more, uh, maybe say evidence based, but also more so, I guess, data driven uh, in a sense. Because I'll be honest, I've thrown probably like. Three at a YouTube channel okay. with, with not a not a lot of evidence to say that it actually benefits our winery, and then our CEO, who also uh, fortunately or for for good or bad happens to be my wife, um, uh, <laughs> continually looks at me and kind of goes, "Brenna, why are we spending all of this money on this this YouTube channel?" Um, but I don't have I don't really have a lot of I'll be honest, like not a lot of evidence to say that this actually does contribute to the bottom line. Um, you know. Is there is there things that individual wine producers could do to to make them their marketing efforts more data driven or more evidence based? I think it's there's a, there's always a trade off. I mean, one of the things that I really learned through experimental design, and then I spent a lot of time and energy being mentored by Jordan Louvier, who is the kind of the founder of choice analysis. Whenever we go to buy something as a consumer. Or, or make any decision. There's trade-offs. When you go to, you know, go on a date or decide to marry somebody, you know, nothing is perfect. There's a trade-off when you do those things. And there's a trade-off even when you're buying a bottle of wine. You go there and say, the perfect bottle of wine is, and it's not there because, oh, the perfect bottle of wine is more than I want to spend. But the perfect bottle of wine is out of stock. So what's the trade-off? I'm here. I'm going to buy it today. Am I going to go somewhere else, you know, drive 25 minutes to find that? Or am I going to trade off and buy this other wine? So our life is a series of trade-offs, right? And so sometimes you don't have all the evidence and you have to make a decision. And I would say with like your decision for the YouTube channel and some of the things we're doing now with social media and digital marketing, I think the evidence comes after the investment. That's a hard thing. That's a difficult thing to make, but that's the truth. You don't really know. And many of the great entrepreneurs of the world, you know, had an inkling, had some evidence, but they jumped in and they did things and it worked. OK, and we don't hear that many stories of all the ones that didn't work, do we? <laughs> but, but, the, but those those are there as well. I think what you can do, though, is when you're, you know, one of the things that digital allows us is to try things usually more cheaply than $300,000, but to try things, whether you're doing, you know, your website and you put up a website with something on the front page, and then you do what we call an A-B test, where you do another website for two weeks with a different thing on the front page and see what the responses are. And so those kinds of things you can do, not that expensively, but can you make every decision based on data and evidence? No, but it gives you a direction and what I hope and what I think we found, I, th- I say we being Ehrenberg Bass and others who are working in evidence-based marketing have found is there are some things that are just stupid and don't work. And, you know, once in a while they do work and people take that as evidence. Well, I was the one in 10,000 where it did work. Yes, you were. But if I'm the other 999 people, maybe I should go the other way and not do that. You know, do, do, so you understand what I'm saying there. And this whole yeah. idea... I mean, I'll I'll lead off with an example, but this whole idea of loyalty, you know, loyalty, and we all want loyal customers. And the fact is, if you define loyalty and looked at that like patriotic loyalty or loyalty to your family or something like that, 
loyalty to a product, a brand, is really ephemeral compared to that kind of loyalty, but we call it that. So what does loyalty mean in marketing? It means coming back and buying again, right? I bought it once and I'm going to buy it again. And that's great. We want people who buy our products more than once. We don't want single buyers. That's obviously um, not very profitable. But to hope for someone to be solely loyal, to only be loyal to your brand, or to only buy, or to buy your brand as one of their preferred wines over five or ten years, yes, there are people who do that, but no, there are not many. We know mm. for a fact when you measure repeat purchasers that every year your twenty percent of heaviest buyers. There'll still be 20% of your buyers will be what we say heavy will count for more than 50% of sales, but half of that 20% will probably differ every year. There's movement among those heavy buyers. You still have heavy buyers, frequent buyers, but they're not the same people over a number of years. So if you give your salespeople an incentive to maintain the same people as frequent buyers and they get some sort of you know, reward for keeping their cl your club, for example, for keep keeping club membership 80% or 90% the same, that is really not a fair goal to give your marketing manager. Is, fair, is it because there's some sort of like half-life to, to loyalty, like yeah, a degradation call, over time? You can call it a half-life. That's a good way. That's a good way to say it. There will be those people who stay forever. There's a few wine clubs I belong to that I've been involved with for 25 years. But every year, do I buy all my allocations? No, I don't. Some years, maybe I was away during the sale, whatever it is I don't buy. So that year, I look at, I look like a non-buyer in data mm. terms. And so I th I'm just saying you have to be careful in interpreting. And yes, we want, we know that about 50% of your buyers are frequent buyers, but we know that the other 50%, which are other 50% of your sales go to 80% of the people. And some of those may only buy you once every few years. But they yeah. So this is, the, uh, so this oh, is obviously this, you know, in a, in a lucid way is this sort of 80, 20 principle. Uh, well, we, we, call where... the, we call it the 2050 principle rather than 2080. Yeah, yeah. And that's what I think that's when you say evidence-based marketing looking at more than I think the original research we did at Ehrenberg Bass was 20 or 25 different product categories, of, you know, from everything from credit cards to fast moving consumer goods to look at what is, what do the 20% of your buyers, rep the, the highest 20% of your buyers represent? It's usually 50 to 55% of your sales. Wow. It's not 80. It's interesting. Some, um, you know, some marketers will espouse this sort of um, evergreen strategy, which is like, we want to continually have, you know, foster it as they always, that I guess the adage in marketing is always, it's a lot easier to get people to spend more money with you than to uh, engage with new buyers. And it was your research, or at least the research you were involved in, when I sort of heard about it for the first time, it was mind bending because it, it sort of, it, it sort of said that, that uh, I guess, statement is largely incomplete if not incorrect because yeah absolutely it is easier to do this except not accepting that there is some kind of like there's a half-life to your most loyal ones and then 80 percent of all your other customers which actually determine the rest of your sales they're going to be very transient and so therefore the conclusion is if you want to grow this is the mind-boggling bit you need more customers <laughs> always like there's a perpetual almost like a turnstile i, I imagine of well, you is. need to continually be engaging new customers. It is, but that turnstile, when those people come through that turnstile, some will become heavy buyers. So it, you know, yes. so it's not like every infrequent buyer, I, you can call it like buyers or infrequent buyers, some of those infrequent buyers become a club member, become a regular buyer. So there, you know, there's movement, but it moves both ways. And I think that was the enlightening bit, that article that was in Harvard Business Review many years ago, 1980s or whatever, that said it's not worth spending money getting new people, you know, that is, abs let me just say, absolutely false. It was based really? on small samples. Again, it was based on a lot of, I mean, Byron Sharp and some others at Ehrenberg Bass wrote a whole 
you know, dis discussion of that and basically disprove that and show, you know, I won't, we won't need to go into the, into all that reasoning, why that was maybe published in a great magazine, Harvard Business Review, but a lot of assumptions that are just right. not true. So it's not poor science. True. Sorry? It's always just poor science. And yeah. then hyperbole that's been blown up. If you want to call it science, I would say it wasn't science. It was like, <laughs> like a lot of things in marketing and a lot of things in business, things work. But sometimes they work in spite of, you know, the evidence that that shouldn't work. And that's great. But if you want to be on the side of probability, and when we talk about marketing in Ehrenberg Bass, what we're really talking about is increasing the probability that some people are going to buy your brand. Of I mean, course. You can't make someone do it, but if you know, if you're let's take a big case. If you're Coca-Cola and you're app spending literally hundreds of millions of dollars of advertising, and you can nudge the probability that somebody buys Coke from a quarter of a percent to a half a percent, that might increase your sales by, you know, a hundred million dollars or whatever each year. And so the same thing goes mm. for a winery in much smaller numbers, if you can increase the probability that someone will remember your brand because you have a nice logo that's easily memorized, you've got a good color scheme, all that kind of thing that makes it easier to hold in memory, you increase the probability that when someone is online shopping, when they're at a store or a restaurant, your brand might be chosen. That That's what we're talking about in marketing. It's not surety, but it's just Balancing the probability so it's a little more than it was before. That's what we're talking about. Have you seen, been tracking, because um, uh, obviously you would have seen the rise uh, and fall, in a sense, of digital uh, or social media advertising. So less so about like marketing efforts that are more um, organic, but actual paid advertising on social media. We... There was a phenomenon, phenom it's still very much in play at the moment. It's just uh, the, the, the rules of the game have changed quite significantly. Um, probably around start of COVID, just before COVID. Are you familiar with how Facebook pixels work with return on advertising spend on social media platforms? So we could I mean, absolutely I mean, predict. What they call engagement, which is so many pixels that get, quote, viewed. Is that what you're talking I'm, about? No, you'd love this. You'd love this. So okay. um, you could you could put a Facebook pixel on your Shopify site. Shopify developed a connection okay. with Facebook that allowed deeper data integration. So we could find out exactly when someone saw an advert, especially if there was a button on that advert, um, because they would have logged in with their credentials to Facebook, which you need to have a uh, profile for. You click on that advert. We could then track them, their journey to our website, then track their okay. journey through the website and then to checkout of which Shopify would then report the cart size yep. uh, and attribute that sale to that advert, um, which that data would then feed back to the advert and the advert would tailor itself to the appropriate audience, grabbing larger and ever increasing amounts of data to be able to put that advert in the right uh, and appropriate people that are most likely to purchase. Which, on one hand, it sounds horrendously evil. Uh, and on the other hand, actually, I actually think it sounds really quite pragmatic because uh, there's nothing worse than getting an advert that you don't want to see. Um, you know, so it's putting you in front of people that kind of want to see you. Um, as a producer, it was awesome because we were getting uh, ROAS of one in 14. Um, you know, so we, and we would need typically, you know, based on the pricing of our products, one in seven, um, to be able to be even profitable. And so if you could give me a, if someone could come to me and say, I can guarantee you a ROAS in one in 14, I'd just give you, I'd give you all my money. I'd give you, <laughs> I'd give you, I'd give you a million bucks because you're going to give me 14 million in return revenue and that's guaranteed. Uh, you know, it becomes a calculation. This is where sort of, I guess, marketing in a sense, uh, and advertising is a, an extension of that, you know, became directly linked to sales, but then it all stopped. Because uh, iOS, an iOS update for iPhones and an Android update. Yeah. Android and iOS seem to be a little bit like yeah. home and away and neighbors in a sense, whatever one does and the other does the yeah. next week. Yeah. iOS came out and said on our new update, basically, uh, you will have to opt in to uh, tracking. And then Android went and did the same thing. And suddenly about 50% of the planet could no longer be tracked via Facebook pixels or even Google um, analytics codes. Okay. Uh, and that kind of broke this this amazing cycle for sellers in the marketplace it, it equally uh rules around privacy you know improved and there was a sensibility to that too 
Um, but it means that now we kind of don't have these these almost like guaranteed sort of ROAS <laughs> figures. So it's sort of kind of funny because you mentioned you're talking about, um, say, Coca Cola. They could they they're not really working on on strict predictors um, of sales through marketing, but they're big enough and have enough scale that if they can just nudge the probability, then there's an easy justification to be able to throw incredible sums of money at marketing. On a smaller end, how does a smaller producer, when you know we have these tools, we're looking for these little tools, you know, we can't really rely on nudging probabilities, can we? We kind of we're we're so close to the edge of unprofitability because we don't have scale <laughs> that we kind of need predictors. Are there any predictors that you could recommend for a smaller winery that would actually kind of like contribute to some kind of like positive outcome? Well, if I could, if I knew that and could harness it, I would I would probably not be retired. I'd probably be out there making money. I mean, the short answer the short answer to that is, you know, without actually tracking people, as you talked about, you know, they over. You know, kind of overrides privacy concerns, it's pretty much impossible. I think what you can do as a small producer, and what you're obviously doing and many others, are trying to put yourself in the, I guess you'd say, it, in the vision, in the awareness circle of people who are more likely. So you, you know, to buy you and to buy wine, and to buy wine of your type or your price range or whatever. And that just sounds like marketing, doesn't it? It sounds like segmentation and targeting. And in a sense, you know, what Facebook was doing is segmentation and targeting, but it's with real time feedback, which we don't normally get in, don't normally get in the marketplace. But so what I kind of step back and say to small companies is when you're going to spend money on marketing, whatever that is, whether it's sponsorship of an event or going to a um, in sponsorship of some, you know, if you're a winery, nobody goes to the guy who's who's making nuts and bolts and said, would you sponsor my footy team or would you sponsor, you know, the, the music festival we're having? But if you're a winery or something, they said, would you give us some free wine and we'll put your name up there because wine is something people want, right? And you have all these opportunities. That's just one example. But you know, we you have a lot of opportunities. Wineries spend a lot of money on having dinners and events for their quote loyal uh, buyers, right? I mean, and I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just I'm, I'm going to get to a point in a second. But let me just keep let me just keep going. Um, you have various opportunities, you know, to spend money on your website, to spend money on social media, to spend money even on social media advertising, as you're saying, and what. The question you have to ask yourself is, will this reach any new buyers or infrequent buyers? Because, Interesting. Yeah, because, kind of like new buyer turnstile well, thing. Because if it's reaching new buyers or infrequent buyers, but who are more likely than others to, you know, like buy what, you, what you're selling, you're also reaching your heavy buyers because they're mm. already there in those same frame. So I'm not saying never do a dinner for your heavy buyers. I'm not saying that. But when you're offered or when you're thinking about spending money on marketing, that has to be the first question. And if you use that question, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm walking around your point because there's no right answer to how you can fully predict, and I'll spend this money and I'm going to get this return. You, you know, there just there just isn't. So you have to take opportunities like here in Australia, we have, as they do most places, we have Shiraz Day, we have Grenache Day, we have Pinot Noir Day. Maybe they're global, but here in Australia, okay, we have that. And so smart wineries that make those varieties, right, they put on their Facebook, on their TikTok, on their Instagram, whatever they're using, starting a week or so before that, hey, Pinot Noir Day is coming up. We've got a great Pinot, whatever it is. You put yourself out there when you're more likely to find people who are interested, right? And then, of course, you have that on your front page of your website. So when people come to your website, there's the button to push. So you make it easy. And mm. that's, you know, unfo that's the best I can say. I mean, I don't think, and I'll, I'll be straight honest with you, Brendan, I'm not a specialist in digital media. You know, when I'm, I'm teaching, I teach one class a year as a retired 
academic. It's introduction. It's wine marketing for master's students in the wine business and other master's programs at University of Adelaide. And I bring in a specialist to talk about digital marketing because they're much more up on the day-to-day, every day they're doing this for their jobs, they're consultants. And I recommend us, you know, the number of small wineries, and we have a number, I'm sure you do around you, of really good small companies who can manage this for you if you don't want to do it. Now that's an expense, but you're trusting somebody who every day is reading what's working and what's not working. You know, somebody who's betting their company on getting returns for you. And so I'm not saying take this company or that company, but I have three companies that I really liked here in Australia. And two of them said, yes, they do it. I can't do it next week because so and so and so and so. But that that's the kind of thing that's the kind of thing that I recommend. You know, it's a long answer to your question, but that's what I recommend. Well the quite often the um like the beauty of digital marketing and engaging external uh, agencies, uh, of, of course, apart from the, the general competencies, is the fact that you can actually find direct attribution to their input. You know, right. you can pay them for X amount and then you can actually see X amount come out the other end and you can kind of measure that. And then at the end of the day, they're actually not that expensive uh, oh, when it comes you... to the, the output they've got. Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, most of them would write some sort of contract that would, you know, at least break even. And you can judge that and you can talk to other people using them and, and make that decision. This is my view, because if if you are a small producer, you know, you got viticulture, you got enology, you may have two or three other people working there, but to have expertise in everything and now in sustainability and all those kind of things. And, you know, carbon accounting is going to be a whole new skill that you know, all businesses have to do and wineries and very much specifically are going to have to do that because they're going to have to register a sustainable c- credential to get into certain retailers. Eventually, this is going to happen and you just don't have the expertise. I mean, our parents used to mow the lawn, you know, every week. And now most people I see around my neighborhood are hiring someone else to come out and mow their lawn. I mean, that's the way the world's going, isn't it? Isn't it? It's funny you mentioned the sustainability thing um, because it was about six years ago, I want to say, that we got certified B Corp status. Mm. We were one of the first wineries, I think the first winery in Australia uh, to do so. It's an initiative that my wife was really sort of passionate about and sort of we all kind of got passionate about it um, as as time went on. So now we become the sort of like the first port of call for any other winery that, that wants to get a bit of a heads up on on what's going like how do we get b corp status what is it actually about does it affect a lot of it is like does it affect sales and the reality is no it doesn't uh That's, but it's just yeah. something we believe that that you should do and it's future proofs you but always the comment that we say to people is do not underestimate the amount of resources that you need to apply to just uh-huh. simply getting it then maintaining it and then recertification which happens every three to five years um, and it is basically a half full time job. It's basically mm. two two to three days a week that you would need. So it sort of precludes a lot of small small producers unless they're like really small and they've got all the time on their hands. Once you kind of get to a certain size, where like you start running at a time, you need to kind of quickly grow to here to have all the the human resources to be able to afford to yeah. to do it. And it's that sort of dangerous middle that where the um, uh, consultants really sort of step in, you know, to their own uh, and service service people along that way. No, I, 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 I agree. And that's the same with, you know, marketing and digital marketing. If you don't have the time to do it right and you really want to spend your time growing grapes and making excellent wine and, you know, you have to be the, somebody has to be the face of your business. So somebody's got to go to those tastings. Somebody has to, you know, even if it's the face on your Instagram posts or whatever it is, you got to put that time in. But if you don't have the time to learn all the other stuff, then you're probably better to, you know, look at the costs and hire someone to do it for you. And, you well, know, it's very interesting. Take, I'm going to get off. Go, go ahead. You have a question. Go I want, t- Taking it something like more analog here, you know, because obviously digital marketing, if you could put like a ballpark cost and everywhere in the world is going to be subtly different, but it could be anywhere from, you know, uh, 500 to say $1,500 per month, you know, can yep. be more than that um, to, to be able to employ a digital marketing agency. And that's got a very measurable effect. 
uh, contrast that with something like quite analog, which I definitely want to talk to you about, about, you know, it's, is it still, you know, uh, efficient? Does it have any efficacy, which is, uh, wine shows and, you know, <laughs> metals and stuff, because that's, that's expensive. Like we looked, we used oh, to, yeah. uh, send stuff to shows and it's like, if you're sending stuff to San Francisco and you don't have an importer, like a thousand dollars, uh, in terms of shipping 500 bucks in terms of entry. And there is dozens if not almost a hundred different wine shows that you could there is i believe i heard this correctly <laughs> someone at darenberg a uh, medium-sized winery in clarenbal uh for those who, who are overseas who don't know know these they smile pretty well i believe they have someone employed almost full time dedicated to <laughs> ensuring that people um uh, submit wines on time for all the wine shows in the world do wine shows matter they matter to some buyers research some I buyers the research I've done is if you're in the high end and we, we can debate whether that's, you know, depending on the country, $25 and up or 50 or $80 and we, we can, de we can debate that. But if you're in that, let's say over 25 or $30 here in Australia, the metals don't mean that much to most buyers as they're, as they're looking, that's the metals have more an effect for people that are literally walking down the shelves and are looking for something to buy and they want some quote objective measure that this is a pretty good wine right and that it works pretty well but anybody who's going to stop and say yeah i'm looking for a light bodied red to do blah 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 they're going to spend a little more time looking at bottles and the metal is going to have much less effect on that and they'll say well what varieties am i looking at what regions make light bodied reds and they're already more cognitively involved in the metal is just a, it's like a logo. It's like, yeah. Okay. Um, I, you know, on the, on the, on the other hand, I don't want to poo poo all wine shows, but the fact is, as you mentioned, if you enter enough of them, you're probably, unless your wine is really bad, you're going to get some metal somewhere. Right. And to be honest, a bronze kind of looks like a gold when you when you put it on your bottle. And for some so it people, is. A, it's it's like merely convincing, not necessarily binding on on no, a on a consumer that, who's basically that, facing a wall. Yeah, and that then that and that's the case. And you know the ones the bottles we've all seen that have a row of metals down the side. I mean that may be convincing to some people, but people who understand or think about wines, what I used to call high involvement people. They don't need that external justification of a metal. Um, and there's also, there's a couple other considerations that go along with that. One is that you have to keep doing it. What if you get gold and then the next two years you don't get any gold medals? I mean, what do you say or do, especially when you're talking to your retailers or distributors who might be using that metal as leverage when they're going out? If you've built your sales on that, that's that's an issue for a company when you decide, one, it's too expensive, or two, you just didn't hit it. And so if you're Derenberg, mm -hmm. and I'm not picking on them anyway, except that you mentioned them, if you enter enough shows, you'll get enough gold medals, and you'll be able to keep, keep saying that. So it does become kind of a burden and chain around your own neck, you know, d d down down the track. On the other hand, I'll just say this briefly, wine shows in Australia, and it's different here a bit than I think in other places because winemakers actually send wines to wine shows, often go to the show dinners or the special lunches they have afterwards, and they interact with other people who did well, and they actually learn. There's a lot of evidence in Australia that winemakers learn from each other when they go to shows. There's an exchange of Hey, you got a gold medal for that new Fiano. What did you do this year? You know, were you, you know, what, mm. what was your, what were your harvest parameters? You know, did you use skin contact or not? They begin talking about it. And so there's this exchange of information, but if it's a distant show and you're sending wine to San Francisco or to London, and you're not going to show up there and talk to anybody, you're not going to get that interaction. And, you know, that's not going to really help you much at all. Can it be overcooked? Like if, if you take a sidestep away from say awards and, and medals, but go to look towards like journalists, you know, two yep. big ones, obviously Robert Parker and James Halliday. There was a joke. I'm not sure if you heard about, uh, it was, it became a bit of a meme probably about like four years ago, like everyone in James Halliday's book got like 94 
And it was like, <laughs> you know, like 94 became the new kind of like passing standard. Are we seeing a, a, a shift and a change in how even consumers perceive third party uh, endorsements, uh, which what? is effectively what a journalist or a wine writer or reviewer does? Yep. Well, I can send you a thesis that was just passed by my final PhD student <laughs> who's, I can't send it without her permission, but she's actually, I'm just one of her team, but she's actually at, um, got her thesis, got her PhD at Bordeaux, University of Bordeaux, but she's working at Burgundy Business School. And part of her thesis was kind of the history of these third-party endorsements and wine writers in, in particular, and how it, that is moved is, I mean, it wasn't all, but I'll, I'll, let me finish what it's about. And she looked at then, are we moving to a peer review status where we're looking at wine searcher and other types of websites where we're relying like we do on TripAdvisor or whatever, relying on our peers to tell us what they like rather than a wine writer. And of course, in many cases, you've got to pay for either. You've got to pay for either of those. If you want to get certain either wine writer reviews or you want to even join the peer review sites you've got to, to get more than two sentences you got to pay money because it's now a user pays and there's no let me just say there's no answer but we have moved from a point where in the 50 before the 50s 40s earlier it was the retailer the negotiant who gave that stamp of quality so i buy from berry brothers in london or whatever it is and it was their decision of what was quality, and you trusted them. And then after World War II, we moved to sensory analysis, made an Amarina Davis, and developed, developed wine measurement and wine sensory. I won't go I won't bore all your listeners with all that, but we got into a more scientific way to think about wine and a more objective way to think about wine. Still, when I give a rating, you give a rating of intensity well, and we may move to the point where an electronic nose can give an exact rating. Okay, fine, but that's beside the point. But we move to that where then people going from that, wine writers begin doing it. And then you had Robert Parker giving the first scale that wasn't a 20-point Davis scale, wasn't giving 17.5 points, but was giving something we all could relate to, 100 points, 90 points, whatever. And I agree, that scale is now, if it's, Below, in general, any wine below, say, 88 is not even going to be listed. There's probably wines people taste that get those scores, but they're never going to be publicized. And certainly if you're a winery and you get below 90, you're not going to put that out. You're not going to put that out anywhere. But we've moved from that and we've moved to people trusting each other and it's, 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 it's a moving, it's a moving feast, so to speak. It's, developing that way and just like we are still listening to tv critics or movie critics and we have critics that we know and we say if that person likes it i'll probably like it and if that person doesn't i think we have that with wine people and of course you know if you're that into wine and you know the difference between different critics and what scales what scores they give then you're able to you know to intelligently think about what scores they give and what wines they like and don't like, but most consumers don't. And so See, it's funny you mentioned that. So we, when we first started, uh, Laura and I sent all of our wines off for James Halliday's, uh, you know, review. And we were so giddy with excitement, you know, we couldn't wait to, <laughs> you know, see. And he wrote this quite scathing review. It was horrible. And we make this this particular wine uh, called Esoterico. It's a um, it's a skin contact white wine or orange wine. If you're in yeah. international audiences, <laughs> and the headline of this thing is amazing. It goes um, uh, their esoter their attempt, their poor attempt at I'm paraphrasing here. Their poor attempt at <laughs> a skin contact white wine in their Esoterico is, in my view, a complete failure. Um, and we're like, okay, well, we're not going to send our wines to him anymore. Uh, but we, because we didn't send our wines to him anymore, that update never actually got, got sort of updated. It never, that review never got updated. So you can actually navigate to James Halliday's website today and go to Unico's find website. That. You can see this. <laughs> now, the funny story, how this actually ended up was Esoterico predominates like 40% of our entire production and we cannot satisfy <laughs> demand. <laughs> Pretty confident we're the largest orange wine producer in Australia right now, uh, all on the back of this, this one wine, which 
uh, yeah. if you jump on, say, you know, something that is peer reviewed, like the Vino is, uh, you know, one of the highest rated uh, skin contact white wines in the world. Um, so it is sort of interesting to see that how like it almost became a badge of honor in some sense for younger audiences that were engaging with wine for the first time that they took as like sort of badge of honor to say, I disagree with what that person recommends. Yep. And that's where it started to become sort of like quite almost, we, we kind of found our people in the sense, whatever they hated, we knew that we had a market for. Uh, well, and it's, it's the same thing I tell people with labels, you know, if you have a label and you do label testing and you get a label that no one hates, you have an incredibly <laughs> bland label that cannot be identified. If you have a label that some people, and I'm just talking about, you know, without the wine or anything, they love it for the artwork or whatever. And other people say, oh, do you see that orange label? Orange is a terrible color for a wine label. Well, you've got one that's recognizable, right? You've got one that sure. people, you know, and so trying to satisfy that middle ground is, my mind, probably the wrong way to go, especially for a small producer, right? I mean, True. if you're Jacob's Creek, you have Jacob's Creek has a bland label. Okay, it's Jacob's Creek, and no one hates it, no one loves it. Good on them. But for a small producer, I agree. You're making a wine that you know some people, maybe myself, I don't know, I haven't tasted that particular wine, may may never like it, may drink it and say I'm never buying it, and someone else may buy it and say, "Wow, that just hits me." And so. Good on you is what I say. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll make sure to get some get some your way after this interview, and you can tell me whether you're not you agree well, or disagree I, with Jake. I, I just opened a bottle of you know skin contact orange wine from Koleski that I bought several years ago, and I had I found it on my shelf. I said, "What the heck?" Oh, oh the Vigilis. Yeah, I I, sorry, was it called the Vigilis? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's, yeah, you know. awesome. Uh, Viognier, skin contact Viognier. Yeah, skin Yummy. contact Viognier. You know, and you know. I don't think I'll be honest. I couldn't drink a whole bottle by myself. With some wines you just glug. I mean, that's glug. This is not a glugging wine. It's a thinking wine. It matched some food we were having, and I enjoyed it, sharing it. Um, and you know, different wines. This is when you become really interested. There's different wines for all kinds of different purposes. In my old age, <laughs> I often open a bottle and pour off half, put it in a small bottle, put it in the fridge because I don't drink a whole bottle anymore. I opened a bottle last night, gluggable as we say, and next thing I know, my wife and I were fighting over the last little bit of the bottle. You know? <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's a good hot tip though for um, uh, you know because it's quite topical at the moment with um, you know, consumption. Control, all that, yeah, yeah. Like someone should come up with a, a product that's a, a little you know because actually acquiring half bottles as a as a winery and actually facilitating the bottling and packaging and distribution of half bottles is exceptionally difficult when you know the yeah. supply chain set up to do something that's completely you know full bottle size but if there was a company that sold like reusable half bottles um you know that people can go hey just decant off half and that way like you can separate out a bottle and that second half is actually just as fresh as the first bit i have a smart idea well for me in my analog method pouring it into a seven a 350 375 bottle up to the top the second upon opening, closing it, putting it in the fridge, three days later, it isn't much different. In fact, the, most wines need a bit of air, and that's perfect. I just decanted it and put it in the fridge. Now, two weeks, maybe not. But, you know, but let's say, Brendan, honestly, I think we're going to see, and I hope we're going to see, a change where, say, like cans can hold wines well for more than a year, more than six or eight months that they can last a year and a half or two years. And then you have, if you're willing to make enough of a commitment to bottle, what I don't know what the minimum is, but to can a, enough wine so that, I mean, I would open a can, a 250 or a 350 can, and my wife and I would drink that if it were available in wines that I like to buy, if you know what I'm, if you know what I'm saying. There's a lot of work going on at the, run, at the moment, obviously, with different sort of packaging options. Cask is finally mm. getting over the hump of um, recyclability at the moment. So there was always yep. an issue with the recyclability of the liner. And there's uh, being trialed this year, I believe, a 100% uh, soft plastics recyclable liner. Uh, can has obviously numerous issues with it. Uh, the first and foremost being patents. 
um, control over the can, but I think most people are overcoming that at the moment. The liner of the can degrades, yep. obviously, due to yep. low pH. That's going to present some other issues as, as to sustainability. Um, you know, how, how can we develop both a liner that is strong enough that is also biodegradable? Um, there's, there's an interesting company that uh, we've been chatting to called Pacamama. I believe it's a Spanish company. You're probably familiar yep. with their flat flat yep. bottle. Yep. We yep. kind of yep. do this in the wine industry all the time where we, we come up with a good idea, but then we overcook it. It's like, let's do a plastic <laughs> bottle. But by the way, we're going to make it flat. I'm like, just just what's wrong with the, just a straight up plastic bottle that isn't a half bottle, that is a full size bottle. Um, and then start looking at bioplastics, looking at, at uh, actual or algal based plastics. Yep. Yep. And the fun thing with plastics uh, is that we can... Um, determine oxygen ingress and egress rates on the basis of the type of plastic so we actually you end up arming winemakers with even better tools to be able to manage uh you know oxygen rates uh in wine but the the problem is you know with plastic is sort of the word is sullied right it's it's in mud uh in essence to be able to sort of figure out i don't know glass definitely has to we got to move on from the glass bottle there's no doubt about that um but i mean cans i don't know do people putting two and a half standard drinks in a single receptacle that is designed to not be sort of, no one's really sort of triggered in their, their heads to want to share like a can of Coke, for example, or yeah, a can of yeah, beer. Yeah. No, it's a you single know. serve. It's, it's, I mean, you know, I've been this, my latest research. And as I say, I'm kind of, ret- kind of retired, but I'm still working with. And the big thing we've been working on is this consumer acceptance and what are the consumer barriers to different types of, of containers for wine and as you say you know do we have to move away from glass i think what we're going to see eventually is solar powered low um energy glass and we're already seeing places you know we used to you know we used to always recycle our milk bottles we had our beer bottles they were taken back and refilled 20 times or whatever We'll see some of that but of course there's big issues because everybody wants a different color glass a different shade and Anyway, that we I don't want to get into that, but consumers look at plastic, as you say, and say it's bad, even without even with a messaging. And we've done a little bit of testing messaging of this is, you know, 40, 50 percent less carbon intensive than glass. It's it's 100 percent recyclable. But, you know, that's already too many words for people to absorb while they're shopping. Right. But it's going to happen. And I think it's going to take, as food miles, a lot of things, it's going to take retailers to say, we want to do this and to put that at eye level on shelves where people can see it and begin to try it like screw caps. You know, Hmm. no one asked consumers, do you want a screw cap? But places that put them on the shelf and consumers, oh, that's easy. That's great. Wine tastes good. What's the big deal? It was actually when our original research we did back in 2000, 99, 2000, when AWRI was doing testing of synthetic corks and corks and screw caps, we did some testing and the biggest barriers were the trade. It were the distributors, it were the restaurants, it wasn't consumers. The trade didn't like it because it was non-traditional. And I have to think that bottles, and I haven't done this research, so I'm going to say that right up front, but I have to think that alternative containers will probably find as big a barrier with the trade because they're more traditional than most consumers. Not Is this all. why we're seeing like really good adoption of sustainable practices in monopoly based countries? Like, you know, Sweden's famous for this. Like they've just yep. put the clamps down going 420 grams for a, a glass bottle. We won't accept anything else. Don't even try. It's amazing. Yep. They just forced the market to become immediately an organic I think something like 40% of all wines, I think I'm loosely correct on that one, or even more, is 100% organic certified. Yep. that's. There's no doubt that those monopolies, and when we're talking about monopolies, there's a lot of monop- alcohol monopolies, and we can go into places like, you know, the Arabic countries, and that's a different kind yep. of monopoly that doesn't care about All through about Canada. But, but if you're talking about Canada, Ontario has been a leader, Sweden... Norway, Finland, smaller markets, Norway and Finland um, have been monopolies that have taken this, you know, sustainability, 
side. I mean, I, I can't remember again, I'm not hot on the numbers, but 30, 40% of the wines sold in Sweden are bagged box because that's what they demand, you know, from the right. producer. But at the point when Tesco and other big retailers here in Australia, you know, the endeavors and they have their own sustain. They have, believe me, they have sustainability teams, right? And they're looking, of course, at the boxes stuff come in and all that. I'm talking about the cardboard boxes. But, you know, when they start putting that as a requirement, that's when the change is going to happen. And consumers, you know, nobody asked me if I would buy tomato paste in a plastic yogurt container instead of a can or a jar. But I go there and say, oh, a four pack uh, recyclable plastic, you know, that's easy. And so, you know, nobody asked me, but hey, it works. I'm sure they did some market testing, but it's got to be in front of a consumer to do that. And I agree the difficulty for a winery is the cost of you changing containers, a lot of different costs into that. And then will anybody buy it? You know, and the fact mm -hmm. you're right, smaller, I mean, a 375 bottle looks like, hey, I could share that with one other person, but a 325, 330 can uh, that's kind of a beer that i would drink myself right and i'm mm, not gonna, mm. even though it's only a few mill milliliters different but things will change i i real i really do think that, that we're we're on the cusp of that happening well larry i'll be honest and you're probably even tracking this as well we basically got the first question in and we've just been talking for the last 55 minutes and I hope, there's some questions i really really want to ask you but i don't want to burn up all of that time um, I want to jump to one question that I was right, particularly excited to ask you because it's quite topical. And also because, uh, you know, in the lead up to any of these interviews, I, I, I like to spend a fair amount of time researching as much as I can about who obviously we're talking to. Um, and you're a joy to, to interview because you've got um, an array of different YouTube videos or videos that feature yourself. Yeah. Um, and you noted that one of your mentors said that a region is only as good as its worst wines. <laughs> Regional marketing is something that fascinates me, um, especially because we've been, you know, backing uh, a region in Australia that's been known for bulk wines, so the Riverland, and seeing what uh, movements that the the sort of leadership there are trying to do to, to be able to bolster the Riverland. And we've sort of seen this sort of happen overseas a bit. So we've seen, you know, Swartland Collective, um, you know, do very well. Yep. Languedoc Roussillon has, has started to revive itself. Sicily has come leaps and bounds mm -hmm. since you know it was known as as a bulk wine region um uh, across most of europe like if if you were the ceo of riverland wine association like what would be your <laughs> because obviously if it's the worst wines there's like there seems to be some amazing wines being made in riverland but there doesn't seem to be a degradation of these these wines that kind of give it that reputation as being not high quality at all well First of all, I wouldn't dig the hole, let alone jump in the hole of being a CEO of Riverland Wines. But I was, <laughs> listen, my first marketing slash association job was for Ohio Wines. And Ohio Wines, for the most part, were Labrusca, so not Vinifera. They were basically juice grapes that were being made into sweet wines. And here I am responsible for marketing. And we have producers who along Lake Erie could make amazing Chardonnays and Rieslings, and now Pinots, who could deal with terrible, the winter damage is an issue, but I, let's not go there, but I'm just saying it's a tough, it's a tough go. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to talk now. You've asked me to speculate, so I'm not, there's no, not real. Evidence. Total speculation. Yeah. Total but, speculation. But, but I will start with the fact that that was Tony Spot, who was my mentor, who said, you know, a region is, really known for or becomes the you know basically their worst wines are what people remember because good wines are good wines um i think the problem with R riverland is a trade issue i don't think most consumers know riverland from swan valley in western australia which is also a hot region that is making some very good wines that people enjoy and will buy. I mean, I do think that that's potentially part of the problem. And, you know, yes, you can as a smaller producer market directly, but you are marketing then again, like the trade, 
the high-end wine buyer, somebody's going to spend, you know, $35, $45 for a bottle of wine or $50 coming from the Riverland needs, in their mind, some justification for that. Tasting it might do it, but, you know, they have to go out on a limb to make, to buy that wine to taste it. And then and that, that's, that's, the, that's the conundrum. I did a study, like a lot of things, I did a study a number of years ago where we looked at Riverland and we were actually being paid partly by Riverland region. And our suggestion was at the end of that study is change your name. Interesting. You know, you've got bad kind of, I mean, to be able, and I'll say from a marketing point of view, to change perceptions of a brand which we're, you know, region is a part of a brand or can be the brand is very, very expensive. Think of Gallo selling wines from Sonoma County or something, you know, and they do, but for the most part, they have different brands that they put on those wines because Gallo has this reputation. And I think, you know, from a practical point of view, like the growers in Ontario, and we're, we're going to take a little side trip. But in Canada, if you have 51% Canadian wines, you can label that wine as Canadian. And the other 49% can be Languedoc. They can be Central Valley, California. And, you know, give yourself a good name for that $5 wine, you know, bad $5 wine, right? buying the cheapest right. rates that they can buy. And I was just in Canada last year and I had to say, if you wanted to, I was with some friends, we spent a couple of weeks in the Rockies and all that. And if you wanted to buy a decent wine and you went out and said, okay, $17, $18, that's pretty good. And you got a pretty ordinary wine when you read where the, you know, the grapes. Anyway, let's take that to the side. The point being, they developed the VQS system, which is a certification that 100% of the grapes were grown in that region by a winery and a vineyard. Cool. And cool. I'm not saying do a VQS, but they had to do that and put that label on their bottle of Ontario wine or British Columbian wine to distinguish it from the other wines that were grown in that region, but blended and obviously not up to the same quality. And that, you know, mm. that has its own problems because it brings with it who gets to make the decision of VQS, who's on the team that tastes or measures or any of that. It brings the whole appellation thing to play. So it's not, we're not talking about a simple thing. You know, that might be if you've got a lot of grapes, which you do in the Riverland. And let's face it, if you reduce your yields, if you're not making 20 tons a hectare or 30 tons a hectare, and growing for super volume where, you know, I I just have to tell a quick anecdote. When I first came to Australia, I was asked by this group I belong to, you know, could you do a wine tasting for us? And, you know, just ba very, very basic. So I went out and bought some cheap wines and I'm tasting and I couldn't tell the Shiraz from the Cabernet, right? <laughs> <laughs> because I bought cheap wines and they pretty much tasted the same. I was looking for those characters and I should have done my homework. I didn't do my homework. And that's what we run into, you know, with the low rent. Were they bad wines? No. Were they were distinguished no. in any regard? No. So They're inoffensive. This, they just better yeah, mean anything yeah, they, to anyone. There was yeah. nothing bad. There were no faults except mm. to say, now I would know by learning more, they probably had added acid or whatever that I wasn't able to perceive at those days. Most consumers wouldn't know or care. Mm. But that's my advice is maybe the Riverland has such a bad connotation or might be cheaper to either yeah. change that or don't put it on your label. Focus wow. on your brain. Yeah. Put it on your yeah, back wow. label somewhere, you know? I mean, I buy wines and I look at it. So that wine was made in Norwood in South, in, you know, which is a suburb of Adelaide. Of course it wasn't, but that's where the company that owns that yes. brand is headquartered. So perceptions are really hard and really expensive to change. Those that mm. perception that links with whatever it is with yellow wines, you know, if you want to talk about our skin contact or whatever, yeah, 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 yeah. you know, and that's why you gave your wine its own proprietary name. 
Yeah. Because you build your own associations as a brand. You've built the associations people have with that brand. And so that's what you do with any new brand. You build the associations as, you know, from the ground up. And that's, you know, rather than utilizing existing associations, which you then have to change, develop new associations. It's well, fascinating, I, yeah, because es Esoterica, when we first made it, uh, we called it Musket Delisandria. No one bought it because, <laughs> what the hell? And then we called it Chopsticks because we wanted to be sort of as suggestive as to sort of like the food that you would have it with. Uh, and that, that was probably a little bit too out of the scope for most people to understand. And the moment that we put Esoterica on, we found that we we were merely meeting consumers' expectations. We basically used the name as a filter. So when someone buys it and they go, wow, this is a little bit weird. I'm like, you did buy a wine that says Esoterica <laughs> on the front. And as a result from that, every time that we go to either, you know, we're talking with other wineries, other consultants, people that are advising other wineries onto like what you should make, what you should sell. And they go, well, firstly, don't sell blends and sell a lot of red wine. I'm like, don't do skin contact whites. I'm like, well, we do a skin contact white blend with like seven varieties in it. Uh, and it's 40% of our whole production and we can't get enough of it. Um, you know, so there's definitely something I think in that in terms of um, like, if you make it a thing, if you, if you made it Riverland, then that's what the story narrative is going to be. But, and all of those grapes for reference that go into Esoterico all come from the Riverland, yeah. um, oh. which is even more surprising, um, you know, that it's as, as popular as it is, but we didn't make it about the Riverland or the stuff that we do talk about in the Riverland is interesting. It's like 1945 planted Zabibo. So we yeah. made it about so, an interesting narrative from it. That's a big, I guess, paradigm shift and departure from 30 ton per hectare Shiraz. Well, right. Well, you can just call it old vine, Sabibo, or whatever you, I mean, you, I'm not saying you should, but what I'm saying is there are words tr when something triggers, and this is, you know, back, back a bit to, you know, neurochemistry, neuropsychology is that we know, and there's been, I'm not the progenitor of this research, but we know that when people have a perception in their brain, it changes how they interpret the signals in their mouth. Mm. So if you mm. tell this, them- that, that same sort of like, if it's an expensive wine, they're going to like it more uh, than if it's a cheap wine. There's been all those studies that have shown the, the, yep. the perception of price point. Yep, they did that. And they put that, you know, put people in a fMRI and they could see the pleasure center of their brain lighting up. Same wine that was $10 five minutes ago is now $90. Wow, that's great. And I think <laughs> in, a, in, in a much, you know, in a much more generic sense, we have all have perceptions. If I open a bottle of Barasa Shiraz, I'm thinking big, heavy red. And if I open a bottle yes. that somebody's now made, and I didn't look at the fact that it's 13.5% alcohol, which could be, we know in Australia, a range. I know when I open a 14.5%, it could be 16 as far as I know, or 15 and a half or whatever. So I'm prepared for that. And I open that bottle mm. at 13.5% and, and say, well, that doesn't taste like Barossa Shiraz. But if I can push out of my brain and say, oh, that's tasty. But that's what mm. I'm saying. We have that perception. You're waiting to justify that perception so take away that you know that take away that filter before you start well larry that's a perfect time to to a perfect bit of advice to to finish up our chat today i am i i, I am so through that hour firstly went very very quickly secondly we, yeah, yeah. we barely touched on any of the questions i've got so many more questions that i really really wanted to ask you so we might consider even a follow-up uh if the audience is super keen and you're you're ready and willing uh, because I really wanted to delve into like different forms of, of social media and what we're doing with China and, uh, you know, what's going to happen to the, f surmise what the future of wine looks like in your <laughs> eyes, unfortunately, maybe no, to another time. But um, Larry, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to chat. Now, I, you, you can see that I'm, you know, I'm high involvement. I love this stuff. And if, and if there's an interest in it, you know, at my stage in life, I'm happy to chat again if it works out. If not, that's fine, too. Oh, mate, well, we'll definitely be um, uh, linking your book in the description as well because you've written an absolutely incredible book that I think anyone that is into wine marketing, uh, small producers or distributors alike, uh, even just uh, wine students, uh, is, is the Bible, uh, in my honest opinion, and most sort of up-to-date uh, in terms of research. It really debunks a lot of myths, I think, in general wine marketing or marketing in general. Um, and also, oh, I wonder if we could get... 
I say you've I done more reading that, than just... many of my. You've done more reading than many of my students. Let me just say that. <laughs> <laughs>